Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Our guest today is Stephanie Dodier, who is a leading expert in the relatively new and quickly growing anti-diet space. This interview was a passion project of mine. I felt that our audience needed to begin learning about or at least simply becoming aware of this growing space in the health and wellness world. For any coach who's been in the health, fitness, nutrition, wellness, or weight loss industry for any length of time, I invite you to open up to exploring that not dieting might be the way forward for some or many clients out there who have dieted their entire lives without any appreciable results, improved health outcomes, or life joy to show for it. For some clients, stopping dieting and learning to accept and appreciate the body as it is ought to be the goal. I find this interesting and awesome and exciting, and I hope you will too. I also take one for the team and vulnerably ask a lot of the dumb questions that need to be asked as you gravitate away from diet culture and toward the anti-diet approach. Stephanie is exceedingly patient and wise in teaching and explaining this to us. She has a world of information for curious coaches to explore, including a practitioner-focused podcast, the Undiet Your Coaching Practice podcast, some excellent teaching webinars available through her website so you can begin to get your feet under you, and a practitioner certification program so that you can learn from the best and invite the non-diet approach into your health coaching practice if that feels right to you. Our show's sponsor is Primal Pro. We've educated and certified thousands of health coaches, and we know that one of the greatest hurdles to getting started with a coaching practice is exactly that, getting started. We want health coaches out in the world making an impact and doing what they do best. So to save you time, effort, stress, and unnecessary mental blocks, we've taken care of the program development for you. Introducing Primal Pro, a fully customizable health coaching app with a 12-week ancestral health program built right in. Simply subscribe to the app, enroll your clients, and the app takes care of nurturing them through 12 weeks of proven diet, movement, and lifestyle education. This lets you do what you do best, coach. You and your clients will communicate with each other directly through the app so you can stay on top of your clients' struggles and successes as they go. Learn more about Primal Pro at primalhealthcoach.com slash primalpro. We are on Instagram, and so are you, and so is Stephanie, and so is everybody. So as you're listening to your favorite episodes of Health Coach Radio, take a screen grab of your podcast player and tag us in your stories at Health Coach Radio. Don't forget, you can always find the show notes for every single episode of our show at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. Let's get on with it. I do hope you'll enjoy this highly educational and important conversation with our guest, Stephanie Dodier. Welcome, Stephanie. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's nice to be here, Laura and Erin. We are so excited to dive into sort of your world. I don't want to, I don't want to spoiler alert. I want you to tell your own story, but you're a unique guest for us and we're really excited to dive into this. So could you just share a little bit about who Stephanie Dottier is, where you came from and why you're here? So I'm a clinical nutritionist by training. So 10 years ago, due to personal health reason, I was in the corporate world. And one day I was on stage and collapsed, got sent to the hospital and diagnosed with panic attack, which I thought was heart condition, but ended up being panic attack. And then I went on a journey of trying to rid myself of panic attack. And that led me into the world of health and wellness for my personal reason. And, you know, the juncture of time at the same time, my company closed. So Aaron, you probably remember Zellers, an executive for Zellers. Uh, They got bought out by an American company and I got a package out and I decided to go back to school. So I went and I already have a health degree. I went and did a degree in nutrition and then opened a practice in Toronto. So I did traditional clinical nutrition for three years. And 
through that, I had an awakening. I had been on a diet since the age of 12 years old, personally. So I was a chubby kid and my mom was on a diet. All my aunts were on a diet. So I joined the pack of women and I started dieting. And I continued my whole life until I got into practice and realized that I wasn't alone. Yeah. All the women that were coming to me, 90% of my clientele were women. And they all were trying to lose weight for 10, 15, 20 years. And they wanted the secret trick. And they were 40, 45. And like, so now it's no longer Weight Watcher. It's now a detox. Mm -hmm. It's uh, low calorie in the beginning of the, the 2010, 2015 kind of drop. Now it was paleo right back in the days, you probably remember like, so people were trying to not diet, but they ended up dieting anyway, always with the intention of wanting to lose weight. And a client gave me a book she was reading called health at every size by doctor at the time, her name was Linda Bacon. And I never read it. Because the first page of the book said, you don't need to diet. And my entire business, my entire life had been about dieting and restricting and teaching people how to restrict food. And a second client gave me the same book two weeks later. I'm like, huh, there, there's something there. And I put it aside. And then one night I was closing the clinic and that book fell off the shelf. Hmm. Well, okay, now that's a sign. I got to read that thing. And I read it and it changed my professional life and my personal life because it explained to me why I was constantly trying to shrink myself and why it didn't work and that there was another way. And that's when I went on a personal journey to learn how to not diet, the non-diet approach to health. And I ended up closing my practice and I went online and that's how we met. So now I advocate for a non-diet approach to health and my business is online and I help women leave the diets behind and learn to interact with health in a non-diet way. Oh, okay. Um, I'm excited. I was, we were talking about this uh, big fan of what you do and, um, trying to learn and understand the, the anti-diet space a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're a thought leader in that space. So I'm, I'm really eager for us all to learn from you. Um, you help women leave the diets behind yeah. and, and, and follow a non-diet approach to health. So when women come to you, when your clients come to you, do they say, Stephanie, I don't want to diet anymore. I'm done with dieting. Or do, does it, do they still have this lingering urge to want to be in a smaller body still to like, do you know what I mean? Like is the battle to want to want to get off the diet hamster wheel strong enough to um, overwrite four generations of diet four four plus generations of dieting, or are they always kind of backsliding? Is it, is that mm. battle strong? So it all depends. I would say that the vast majority of women are stuck in suffering. And because the message of the anti-diet world, the non-diet approach to health is getting stronger, like literally on Google Trend, it's booming. They're hearing about this way of living that they don't have to restrict food. They're curious. They come knocking at the door. They ask questions. They listen to the podcast, but the lingering is the fear of fatness or otherwise call fat phobia. That is with them 90% of the time, they start the work of leaving restricting eating behind. Mm -hmm. So is that how you defined diet restricted eating? Would you, can we take a step back a minute sure. and have you define for us what you mean by diet and then conversely the anti-diet approach to health? I think that would be a really helpful place to start. So for me, there's not an official definition, but for me, dieting is restricting 
external control of food, overriding the innate wisdom that each human have the capacity, the eating cues that we were all born with to eat. All of us were born with that. And a form of restricting eating comes into our life, either for reason of weight, and most recently for health reason, think paleo, keto versus low fat, low calorie, that things come into our life and throws out the natural ability that we have to eat in favor of external rules. So when I talk about dieting, I talk about both restrictive eating from a health journey or from a weight loss journey. Does that make sense, Laura? It does. You know, I, and I'm just speaking to this from the point of view of my own practice, you know, I mean, and and I, I think every woman listening, and I don't want to discount men because I know men struggle with this too. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think the three of us work predominantly with women and the vast majority of women come to us for weight loss, you know, yes. and it's the reality um, of our business, right? Right. And when I first started, it was kind of like, well, of course, of course, yeah. that's one of your goals because that's what women are always doing. And now that I'm 10 years into this, every relationship I start with, will tell me why. You know, yes. let's talk a little bit about, because, you know, a lot of times, a lot of the women that I work with are not extremely overweight. What they're trying to mm-hmm. do is lose like the last 10 to 20 pounds. And I'm trying to have a conversation with these women that that kind of weight is not necessarily metabolically unhealthy. Yes. Right. There's a, so, so, you know, we get into this notion that let's just redefine, can, can we take the dirtiness out of the word diet? It's, it's just the way that you happen to eat your environment, the things you prefer, what make you feel good, what have you, and start learning how foods affect your body. And just let's stop dieting and learn how to eat. That seems to trigger something in a lot of women, but I I think it's really hard for so many people. It's been so ingrained to get over this innate definition of what diet means. So one other thing I'd like to go for me to be able to explain why you see this like deep desire to like lose the last 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. I want us to go kind of sideways a little bit and talk about system of oppression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we live in a society today that is a patriarchal society. That is a society where men uphold power over women. And in order to uphold this power, there's certain dynamic that are in place in our society in order to keep this group of people, women, unsecure and not claiming equality and power. And one of the system that is in place in our society right now is what is known as diet culture. Mm -hmm. which is the system of belief that a woman's worth is in her ability to meet certain beauty standards. And if she does, then she's deemed worthy. And if she doesn't, then something is wrong with her and she must chase this conformity. And we are socialized. So what you're saying, like it's so ingrained, it's like if you study neuroscience, you will see it's in our belief system. It's in our deepest part of our subconscious brain as people identified as women, that we must meet beauty standard, which happens to be thin bodies right now. Mm -hmm. 150 years ago would have been different, but right now it's thin bodies and looking young all the time. Right. So there's a system of belief that fuels that. And then the weight loss and the wellness industry comes behind and say, hey, we have a solution to this thing you're chasing so badly. And then women come into this business and start buying program in order to meet this because literally their sense of worth as a human being is in is at risk. Mm-hmm. So that it is 50 pounds, 100 pounds, or 10 pounds, it's the same suffering inside of them. Mm -hmm. That's what you're seeing in your office, Laura. 
is that indoctrination, socialization in the depth of the subconscious mind that most women don't even know it's there. They just think it's a fact. It's life. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I get so angry. <laughs> I get, I get really worked up. No. Um, and as I've been kind of going down this rabbit hole, trying to learn anti-diet culture and, and, and the, the fat acceptance movement, which is adjacent to it and, and uncovering the patriarchal and racial um, origins oh, yeah, of it like, as well. That's another it's, thing. Like, oh, it's wild. It's crazy. I was, I was thinking like in my head, I've, I've, I've shared this soundbite with, with in my social feeds and stuff. Um, you know, your story, have you been dieting since you were 12? Same, yeah. but probably since <laughs> probably the awareness that worthiness comes from appearance has been for, forever. My, my soundbite that I've used is, is from what I can tell, it's been four generations because my grandma, my mom, me, and then I have, I don't have children, but I have young nieces. And I remember my very young niece when she was four or five, um, somebody told her she was pretty and she, and she is <laughs> pretty little girl. And, and her face lit up yes. like I'm pretty. And I thought to myself, no, not that generation too. But then it's like, I, I, I honestly, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but I don't see any way out of it. Like how many more generations is this, or is it, do you think, do you think we can claw our way out of this at some point generationally? You must. I love this question. I believe so, because I believe in me, I believe in you and I believe in women's power. Mm-hmm. We have been surviving all this shit, sorry, the word, but all these systems mm-hmm. that have been put against us for so long, we have this ability within us to claw ourselves, as you say, out of this and change the future for the next generation of women. I, but it's I wanna... not, it's not going to come from anyone outside of the group women. It has to come from the women healing themselves first and then teaching it to the next generation. Sorry if I interrupted Aaron. No, I was interrupting you. <laughs> that okay. was rudely, but I was interrupting you because I got excited when you said that I had a client come to me recently and in her discovery form, you know, when we asked like, what, what do you hope to get out of this coaching relationship? She said, I want my daughters to know a different way. Yeah. That was her goal. And I thought, Oh my God. Yes. Wait, we right now are in a position of, of taking some of this power back and changing it for the future generation. Yes. So and I, to me, that's the only way it's going to change. We have the activists that do the political work that needs to be done, but the most impactful is each one of us here and each of the people identified as women listening to this show, doing their personal work to no longer respond to diet culture and fat phobia, be confident, and then pushing that down, just like trauma is passed from generation to generation until it's interrupted. Fat phobia will be passed down until it's interrupted at one level of the generation and it will stop for the next one. Yeah. Laura, you have young girls. I mean, how does this resonate with you? You know, um, I've always tried to lead with other intrinsic, um, Look, I mean, I want everyone to feel beautiful. You know, I don't, I don't think we necessarily have to shy away from someone saying, I feel beautiful it, the way I am, you know, but I also want them to be smart and kind and strong. You know, I've owned a gym for a number of years. I'm a huge meathead like gym rat. I've got my girls in here doing pull-ups. They're doing push-ups. They're jumping on boxes and they're proud of what their bodies can do. And that's what we're focused on, but it's, oh, I, I don't want to, sh- I, I, I guess I just, I don't want to shame these terms. I just don't want that to be their whole identity. Mm-hmm. I want them to feel beautiful in their own way. And they're very different. My girls are twins. They're the same age, literally grew in the same belly. We're born on the same day, but very different. They're built different. They have different coloring, different strengths and weaknesses, totally different human beings. And we try to do our best to celebrate both of their strengths. The hardest part is comparing them, mm-hmm. not comparing them, you know, because they do look very different. Which one's Charlie, which one's Sammy, 
And, you know, the easiest way is kind of hair color, you know, but they are built very differently. Um, Sam is, boy, man, she's just a bulldozer. She's super strong, you know? Um, and it can, it, so there's different, it's, it's really, really difficult not to compare them and the way they look and feel, but I want them both to grab onto what their strengths are and the, and what they view as, I guess what they view as beauty to them and, mm-hmm. and lean into that and, and own it. You know, um, my, I have an older daughter who watched me really struggle with my own weight really watched me struggle with my own body image. Um, that, I mean, I, there's a lot that I did, not that I did wrong. I didn't intentionally try to ingrain anything in her. She was just watching me and I want to kick myself, you know, watching me constantly dieting and running all the time, all in this name of health, when really that actually made me sick, you know, but she was also there to witness that transition too. She was there to witness this, you know, mom in this pursuit of a certain body image and a, in the pursuit of something actually got very unwell and unwound all that and decided to make different choices. And I remember having a conversation with her one day when I changed my diet, um, we were talking about this. I said, what I'm trying to do is get away from just equating everything to calories and moving more towards what does this food do for my body? How does it beneficial to me? And I'm trying to make choices that way so that I can feel stronger. And, and what I was trying to explain to her is the benefit of that is that I have more energy. I don't get sick anymore. I sleep better, all these other things. Um, and the fact that I didn't feel like I had to diet anymore because the foods I was choosing I, I, I didn't find myself feeling like I had to restrict anything because I, I didn't feel as though I was denying myself anything that I wanted to have, but that was a long journey, mm-hmm. you know? And so my little girls now, my twins have never, never saw that other side of me. Um, they've really kind of only known this, but at the same time, they, they ask a lot of questions about kind of appearances and like, like my daughter, Charlie's asked me, Hey mommy, why do little kids have bellies and grownups don't? I'm not sure where she got that. Like we all have bellies, you know, but she was asking these questions. It's something she's noticed about certain appearances around, you know, and, and I said, no, we all have bellies and it's just, you have your little organs in there and you just have a smaller body than I do because you're littler and you're younger and, you know, but everybody has bellies and everybody comes in different shapes and sizes. And that's what just makes people amazing is that we're all so different you know, and it, she kind of puzzled over that for a little while. Um, and that was the last question. Like I I really didn't try to dive super deep. I just kind of wanted to address her concern and see where that went. And sort of, that was the end of it. But I mean, I'm, I'm working really, really hard to try to create a different environment for my little girls, because I, you know, there's things about when I raised my first daughter that I, I wish I had done differently. I got a do over kind of, you know, I feel very blessed. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a long answer to your question, Aaron. Well, yeah, I just, I think, I think about the moms. I just think about the moms and I know Stephanie, if you, if you deal with like mom guilt in, in your practice. Um, well, <clears throat> the mom guilt that kind of Laura, like kind of riffed on is often erased when we teach where it comes from like why was Laura back 10 years ago or 15 years ago behaved this way wasn't her fault no it's how she was raised and how her mom was raised and her grandma was raised and how society is built for Laura to respond this way once women understand that the guilt kind of melts away because it's no longer about them being the problem. It's society, the problem. Mm-hmm. So it's shifting where the problem lies from the individual to the structure, the society and the construct around us. Mm-hmm. So I have we- a proposition for you, Laura, for children. Mm-hmm. I love to give this one to moms. Yeah. So one of the thought that I like to leave moms with, with regards to body 
is this one. It's an intentional thoughts that says my body is a tool to experience life. Yeah. If we can raise children, girls and boy under that notion that our body is just a vehicle to experience life without any expectation, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be healthy. It's just, it's a tool. We're all born with different genetic, different ways our body is going to express health is just a tool to experience life. And then we use our body from that perspective. And then we engage with our body with that perspective. It neutralize any impact of society's teaching on our body. I got excited when you said neutralize. Sorry. <laughs> I guess, it's like magic. Because this, this body neutrality thing, yes. uh, it's yes. so hard to articulate mm-hmm. because, because we don't, we've never in our lives, it's hard even to articulate what I'm trying to articulate. It's, it's impossible to articulate the idea of body neutrality because as soon as you do, and I've tried, I was like, what if, what if it didn't matter? What if it absolutely did not matter what our bodies look like? What if we didn't care about bodies? Wouldn't that be, well, yeah. And people will say, yeah, yeah, I don't care. But I mean, I like looking strong. I just want yes. to strong. Like, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Like, no, that goes away too. You are strong right. or whatever, but it's not about looking strong. Like, I really would love, we could just stop talking about bodies that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people that look strong that are not healthy people. Yeah. So it's about just being strong and the, what your body's capable of doing and allowing you to experience. I love that idea. You know, this, this is what my body is here for is to help me experience life. And what do I want that body to do for me? I really picked that up when I started studying Buddhism, because Buddhism is all about using our body and our senses to experience life. And truly, that's why we have bodies. It's the senses we have that makes us enjoy life. I mean, what we look at, what we smell, how we touch, how things Mm -hmm. sense, that's what makes life great, is how we experience it through our senses. And our senses sit within our body. Yeah. And then food gets neutralized as well. Because when you start thinking the body is neutral, it's just a tool, it doesn't mean anything about me, then the food we put in our body is neutral as well. Meaning that we don't get a sense of worth from making food choices. Because often, this is where people transition. They go from the bucket of okay, it's about weight loss. I'm going to use food to lose weight, just like I did. And then we're going to transition to health. So now I'm going to use food to be optimally healthy. So my sense of self-worth, I was in at risk with the size of my body. I'm going to put that aside, but now I'm going to get my sense of worth from eating well and doing everything that I can for my health. Like if my health is a personal responsibility, and if I don't do it well, then I'm failing me and society. That's what I call righteous eating. Righteous. How, okay. Can you explain? Yes. Um, so the pursuit of health. Yes. I love this. We love this. Yep. Um, how, how does, okay, this is a loaded question, but we often say, we say, I need to lose weight for my health. Yes. So how do you talk around that? And, and I, I'm asking this question because I, again, I'm diving into fat acceptance, trying to understand yep. it and, and fat phobia. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people will say, oh, I just want, I don't care what you look like. I just want you to lose weight for your health. And that, that's a hard no in the, in the fat acceptance world. Don't worry, don't worry about me losing weight from health. So how do you speak to that? Okay. So we talked about diet culture, which is beauty and the sense of worth as an individual. There's many beliefs that are hidden below that. And one of them that diet culture uses to motivate people to to comply to beauty standard and buy all the products is health. So it says, 
okay, maybe it's not about beauty. You don't care about that, but you have to do it for health because health equals weight. Right. When we start diving into factual information in research, right? Because a lot of us here are familiar with that. So I'm going to expose a concept of research, which is causation versus correlation, mm -hmm. right? So when we look at research, they're either researching association risk correlation or they're actually identifying causative agent to something. So in the case of health, this X cause X, like diabetes is caused by this. Mm -hmm. When we cycle through the research and we say, show me research that say weight, body weight, fat on the body causes disease. Guess what? None. Yeah, there isn't any, right? None. There's a plethora of association correlation because fat phobia is also in the medical system, the research system, right? Because we have to know research is paid by pharmaceutical. It's paid by industry that benefit the research results, right? So they will pay to have causation associated and then create a product for that. So when we look at research, we have to look at other people creating and doing the research fat phobic and vast majority of bodies that do the research are fat phobic. They believe from the get go, it's an assumption in the research that fat equals disease or weight equals health, but there's none, there's no association. So from there, we need to think about what can I do if there's no proof that body weight influence health, what, what is everything else that can impact health? And this is where health at every size or known generically as a weight neutral approach to health mm -hmm. comes from. So this is the emerging clinical approach for practitioner to practice under saying, if I take weight completely out of the equation for health, I'm going to work with everything else. I'm going to work with mind. I'm going to work with emotion. I'm going to work with sleep. I'm going to work with all the other thing that can promote health. We call that health promoting behavior. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the question was from the beginning yeah. because I'm lost in my explanation now. It's good. It's Did good. I answer? I think you did. And I think you probably blew a lot of listeners' minds okay. who are probably, and I know that you, you train practitioners. And yeah. so this is, you know, this is a zone of genius to yours, but I'm sure I'm certain there are people listening who will say, well, yeah, but I mean, you're healthier if you lose weight. Well, yeah, but I mean, what about, you know, so I guess speaking now to the practitioner mm -hmm. or, or I guess when you get folks when you get practitioners coming to you to be trained in this methodology yep. and this approach, um, how do you, how do you unwind their beliefs about what other people need, I guess? So um, we're going to respond that with saying vast majority of practitioner have been impacted by diet culture personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So either through disordered eating behavior, through fat phobia, through uh, health obsession, weight obsession. So there's actually a piece of research on this. So there's a, an international study that was done in 2012 in 14 countries in university dietetic department. And the student, the body of student in those 14 countries were asked to rate their personal eating behavior and their colleagues. And the result at the end was that 77% of dietetic students had disordered eating behavior. So when I talk to professional or start working with professional, I first look at their personal relationship with food, mm -hmm. their personal relationship with body, their dieting history. And say to myself, the but they're giving me, but Stephanie is coming from them 
and their own personal journey and them feeling threatened personally, because we have to be realistic. And I went through this when I was in transition from my clinical practice to what I do now, I was terribly afraid Mm -hmm. because when I realized this book was telling me, I'm like, everything that I do is encouraging women to restrict food and to lose weight. What am I going to do if I don't prescribe meal plan? Like that's my livelihood. Mm-hmm. So there's two factors that play their personal status as far as food and body image. And then the fear of, but how am I going to earn money then? Yeah. Well, I just want to just finish my thought on this because um, when I was in university, I was going for uh, whatever a business degree, but all my, all my electives were in the uh, dietetics school, school dietetics. I just kind of, for all intents and purposes, minored in nutrition, which is a weird combination of business and nutrition, but, but it's because I was fully anorexic and I wanted to go to school so I could obsess about and learn about food so I could obsess about it more. So when you share the statistic that people in dietetics programs are disordered, it's like, I went into the school of dietetics be, because my eating disorder drew me to wanting to be more obsessed with food than I already was. So, but I would, I, I guess my, my sort of wrapping up commentary is anybody listening to this who's feeling threatened by this conversation I mean, have an honest conversation with yourself about what your relationship has been with food and no, no judgment, but just have an honest, deep look inside. <laughs> why, why are you feeling threatened by this? So thank you for that. You're welcome. So if that's you listening right now, you that have a, I have a uh, webinar, a free training called the five steps to teach nutrition without diet culture or without oh, cool. food restriction. So go and take that class. And then inside of it, I do the official science-based intuitive eating assessment or the relationship to food official science-backed um, assessment with you. So go and take it and then do the evaluation and the secrecy of your own house with nobody looking. Right. That will tell you if you're part of the 77%. Mm-hmm. And likely you are. I was. Erin was. Yeah. You I know, to a certain degree, we there's all, no shame there. Yeah, we all we all relate to that. But I I want to play devil's advocate yep. here a little bit because um, I 100% agree with you that there is mm-hmm. no causal proof about weight and th- that that causation. But there's a ton of correlation. For sure, a ton of correlation in there for many reasons. Um, and so this is where I also think some of, some of this comes from. And so the question, is it a a chicken or the egg kind of thing, right? I I do not believe that being overweight causes you to be ill, but I do believe Mm -hmm. you being ill can also be part of weight gain or what have you in a, in a healthy, in an unhealthy fashion. Right. So my question is from the standpoint of sort of addressing this and how do we work with people Because at the end of the day, again, this comes from someone who's owned a gym for a number of years where people have lost some 20 pounds. And then what I hear is my joints feel better. I can Mm -hmm. move a little easier. I can breathe better. My sleep apnea went away, like these kind of things. So there's, there Mm -hmm. is definitely a connection there, but it's how do we as coaches work with our clients to get our mind off the goal being losing weight right? This is, this is what I, this is what I aim to do with every client. Let's get the goal off losing weight and get the goal to be, to resolve these other issues without me trying to diagnose or treat anything. That's not it. Let's determine what behaviors and habits and choices actually help me have the energy I need to get out and move my body and do what I want my body to be able to do without sort of weight being part of the conversation. That's what I struggle with. So we'll go to the first part of the question. There's a plethora of associated correlation because what we do know is when people lose weight, they just don't do one element. They will also start moving more. They will also start being in fresh air more. They'll adopt 
other health promoting behavior. And we aren't in, in research able to say, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one. But we do know that you can have the same health status at any weight. Like I'm in a fat body and I have better health today than before. Right. So we know it's accessible because I can engage in all the other behavior you mentioned, Laura, mm -hmm. without losing weight. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I can help myself be healthier without making it about weight loss. Now, here's the piece as a health coach, what do I need to do? Here's, this is my opinion. There's no research on this. This is clinical observation. What is missing in order to get to help people adopt health promoting behavior sustainably, consistently for the rest of their life is the mindset work. Mm -hmm. helping client teaching client how to use their brain we're so focused on below the neck like the appearance that we don't teach our client how to use their brain in order to create sustainable habit we use fear-based motivational element like weight beauty you're not going to be healthy all the fear-based stuff and it worked until it doesn't, until willpower, quote, runs out. And then people revert back to their whole habit because they didn't change the most important organ of their body, their brain and the nervous system. Mm -hmm. If yeah. that is not impacted, nothing will be sustainable for the rest of their life. And this is what separates a coach from a nutritionist or from another yes. type of practitioner is this focus on mindset work. You know, one of the things that I try to, when I try to explain to my clients kind of what coaching is all about and, and how, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to treat your diabetes. That's not what I do. I'm not a doctor, you know, but what we're going to, so let your doctor focus on the illness. Let's let your doctor focus. And that that's what he or she's doing you and I are going to work on all the other things that are within our control. We're going to focus on the behaviors, the habits, and the choices that make you a healthy person. And that the degree to which your type two diabetes might fall away, maybe you'll lose a couple of pounds. Hey, bonus, right? But the focus is on the behaviors. The focus is on the choices, the education, the resources, because that's over time. What's truly sustainable is what's within our control. I know so many people who like you have been overweight their entire lives and they spend their entire life chasing being in a smaller body instead of focusing on just the behaviors and the habits and the things that make them feel good. We interviewed our founder for our school um, a couple of weeks ago. And that's what he said. He said, at the end of the day, my question for you is how do you feel? Mm -hmm. do you feel good. I don't care what size you are. He said that. Remember Aaron, you know, mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, it's how do you feel? And if you don't feel well, that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on the wellness side of the equation. And it's what differentiates coaches from so many of the other practitioners that are out there that I think can make just a game changing transformation for people when they finally realize that it's been within their control this whole time. Well, I would mm -hmm. jump in and and add that one of the perspectives, one of the ways coaches help is that we are a constant force in our clients' lives. We're in a relationship with them because we can say that and they can, they can feel that it doesn't matter what size body I'm in. I feel great. And then they can step out into a culture that does not support that narrative yes. at all. Right. right. Like, so, Aaron, Aaron and I want to comment on this. Off. It wasn't my control all along. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to blow some mind here. Okay. We would love to believe that health is within our control, that our body therefore is in our control, but it's not true. Mm. When we look at, well, again, we'll go to science first. When we look at what determines like the determinant of health, mm -hmm. Only 15% of what determines health in human being is within an individual control. 
the balance is not within their control. So we'll go to the, the one I love to use because it's, it's very explicit. People like to say, well, it's in your control to eat healthy, whole food or whatever, however you classify food. Well, for 50% of the population, it's not. They don't have access to food. They don't have access to food in general. They don't have access to fresh food. They don't have access to certain food because of financial situation. So how can it be within our control? It's a privilege to be able to choose the kind of food we eat. We have to sit within that. It's a privilege that if we didn't have the privilege that we have either financial, racial, class privilege, we wouldn't be able to access the food that would make us feel better. And then we can go around like this pie chart of all the social determinant and say, for an example, if you are a person of color living in certain part of the United States, you have an extreme amount of stress imposed to you by the color of your skin. The white person doesn't have that, but the black person does. Is that then his or health completely in her control when she's constantly being aggress, being abused because of her color? And it's the, the determinants of health you can go around the pie chart like that and the vast majority is not. Right. So is health really in our control? We can influence health, but if you're born with a set of genetic that you're predisposed, for example, to breast cancer, you can try as hard as you want. You may not be able to avoid it. Is it then your fault if you have breast cancer? Now the wellness industry uses again the shame blame and guilt to say to people well if you're sick you caused it it's not go work hard and buy all our product to make up the badness that you are because you know you're sick so we have to be really careful on which motivator we use with our clients mm -hmm. I was writing some curriculum because Laura and I do, we do work for a school that certifies health coaches and I'm the curriculum director. And I, I was working on the curriculum around the social determinants of health. And it was like, holy shit. Uh, yeah. Like, so any, again, if you're listening and you haven't considered some of the, so, specifically the social, you're talking about broad determinants, but even the yeah. social ones, like consider the fact that some, some uh, urban developments don't even have sidewalks. So you tell your client to go for a walk and it's like, I can't. Okay. Like, <laughs> I actually had a client in a group program of mine. This is embarrassing. Who I was like, everybody, everybody go for a walk. Walking is the most metabolically important exercise you can do. Why? Everybody, and you know what? It's easy and everyone can do it. Guess what? She's in a wheelchair. Guess what? I'll never, guess what? I'll never say again. I, you'll never hear me say walking is easy and everyone can do it. I'll never like, I, I watch my language so much now just becoming awakened to some of these, these determinants. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to really, I think language is, I think language is one of the, uh, the tools that a coach needs to really hone, to be honest with you. So I have a, a question to follow up on kind of a lot of what you just said. Yep. Um, so as health coaches, or at least my goal is to try to help, help my client feel empowered. And yes. if I'm going to tell them that only 15% of their ability to be healthy is within their control. First of all, I'm not going to tell them that, but, but knowing this, you know, where do we go as health coaches then mm -hmm. If 85% of their ability to be healthy has absolutely nothing to do with what they do, the choices they make, the habits, all of that. What's the answer then? How do we empower our clients? So empowerment. So let's define empowerment first, okay. right? Okay. Empowerment is about someone in my books, about someone being able to make choices for themselves, right. right? So if we want to empower our client as a health coach, the first thing we need to help our client is recover their ability to trust and respect their body. Indifferently of what the outcome will be, do you want or do you know or can I help you 
rely on your body to make decisions for your life. So for an example, following eating cue, hunger, fullness, satisfaction, how food feel in your body, not because you need to be healthy or because you need to lose weight, just because this is how a food feel in your body. So instead of pushing them to external guideline or external element, the relationship between the health coach and the client should be about internalizing their relationship to their body and maximizing what's within themselves, therefore their control. And how do you define, for an example, most clients will say, I just want to be happy, right? How do you define happiness? What is happiness? from? Is it because you can only access happiness if you're a certain size? You can only access happiness if you're a certain health status? Like we need to clean that up. Mm. Like happiness is within you. It's within the thoughts you think and the emotion you create from your thoughts. Can we focus on that? And your life will be so much better. So to me, that's how a health coach comes into the picture as far as helping their client. Yeah. Um, when I started my practice, I guess, eight years ago now, cause I, like you exited a corporate career, mm-hmm. um, and I got through my own health transformation, which I'm not going to bore you with, but I came up with this tagline for my business. My business is called eat simple. And the tagline is achieve an effortless relationship with food, because that was one of the really cool outcomes that I'd had when I finally extracted myself from just a lot of the sort of woes that I had been suffering. But what's so interesting is that when I, f- when I first went to business, it was like the effortless relationship with food was packaged up in terms of you can lose weight without stress, yes. stressing out about it. Then as I kind of went through my journey, it was like, well, I don't like that language. So then it was like, you can have an effortless relationship with food, peacefully coexist with it, achieve great health, and you'll lose weight as a cool side effect. And now I'm like, I don't like that either. <laughs> like now I'm at this point in my continuum where it's like, you literally can go through your life not giving a damn about food. It, you can go through life not giving a damn what the scale says. You can go through life not giving a damn what size pants you wear. You really can. Yeah. Uh, it's a hard sell. But like, I feel really, I feel really passionate about it to the point where when I get on the phone with prospective clients who, and, all, and all they can talk about is like, I'll be happy when I'm in a smaller body. It's like, I can't help you with that. I, I'm not the coach for you. It, mm-hmm. When you're ready to let like carve off that second half of the statement, <laughs> or then we'll work together. It, it feels nebulous. I think that's maybe kind of maybe what, what maybe Laura's last question was. It's like, so the practicing health coach who, who wants to, or it's in the same vein as maybe what Laura's last question was for the practicing health coach. When we stop talking about food in the context of health and health in the context of body shape and size, what's left for us? You know, it does feel like we've just lost a big chunk of our, um, category in some ways, because it's for I'm going to offer something else here. There's a statistic, and I can't tell you exactly how it was created, but that 91% or 89%, I can't remember, of women have been or are on a diet. Oh, yeah, I believe that 100%. So there's 89 or 91 percent whatever it is of women that are in need of repairing their relationship to food there's probably more women that are in need of repairing their relationship to their body image right we are not going to run out of work (laughs) right it's the focus of your practice may change but people need help right? They need help recovering a, what I like to call a normal relationship to food using a methodology in my case, which is intuitive eating. And then women need help neutralizing their body. We had this big conversation at the beginning. There's a process for that, Mm -hmm. right? You can formalize that into a method, into a package, and there is people to help and you'll not run out. Right. Yeah. And especially because this, this, to your point, like this is a growing a Google search. People are, are wondering how the hell do I get out of this diet spiral? Like it's, it's coming up for clients. So it, it's an emerging market, if you will. And it goes by cycle, right? If you, if you look at women's, like I have a, a, a workshop on the 
history timeline of women's body ideal. Mm -hmm. And it typically goes by cycle of 150 years, right? 150 years, I think it's six generation, and then it starts changing. We're due for the next evolution of how diet culture and patriarchy is going to shape women's body ideal. My hope is there will no longer be any body ideal whatsoever because women will claim back their power and get diet culture out of the picture. But fundamentally, all of our discussion here is centered around certain body type. So if we take that out of the picture, and that's what's happening right now, there's an awakening to that. That's why you see the Google search trend. I think that's the next evolution of health coaching is recovery from diet culture. Yeah. I mean, to use Aaron's point about, you know, I'll, I'll be happy when, you know, I, I know a lot of very thin people that are not healthy people, not to mention how unhappy people are in an effort to just maintain that. Not to mention how miserable people are in the process. Right. Mm-hmm. So we got, got just we got to disconnect that notion that the way I look is in any way related to my actual happiness and my self-worth and how I feel. That's a tremendous and and well within the scope of a health coach and having that deep conversation with people. Um, You know, and I I think at the end of the day, to use some of Aaron's terminology, um, just aiming towards that effortless relationship with food, that food is a tool and experience that we um, hopefully enjoy that allows our body to do what it is we want to be able to do and, and experience, you know, the world around us. So I think Aaron and I both feel very comfortable in the more intuitive eating space. Neither one of us are big fans of, we, neither one of us write meal plans. We don't put anyone on a diet. We're not fans of macros or any of that stuff. It's really more around hunger signals and intuitive eating. So I would mm-hmm. love to hear a little bit about um, intuitive eating in your terms and kind of, um, how you define that and, and use that in your practice. So I'll contextualize it for folks. So we've got kind of, when we look at the non-diet approach, we kind of cut three sector. We got food, we got body image, and we got health. So the framework with health is what I talk about, the weight neutral approach to health or health at every size. When we think about body image, about neutralizing the body. And then the other component is food. So how do we repair this relationship to food that got screwed up by dieting or meal plans, call it as that. There's different processes. The most popular and the ones that that is backed by science the most is called intuitive eating. So intuitive eating is a process that was born from Evelyn Triboli and Ellis Roach in the field of eating disorder. So they were both nutritionists, treating eating disorder. And then they came up with a process to repair the relationship to food that's called intuitive eating. So Evelyn will describe it as a self-care eating framework where body wisdom is used to make food choices. So body wisdom being this interoception awareness. So interoception awareness is this ability to sense your inner world. It's used a lot in uh, trauma healing, somatic experiencing, right? It's the ability to sense the untouchable within the body. And that's where our eating cue lies, hunger, fullness, and the most unknown, which is satisfaction. So it's about using a 10 step or 10 layer approach to food to repair that. So reconnecting with hunger. So reconnecting with our body generally to be able to feel our body because most people are not able to feel their body. Just start right off the bat. Like that's, if you want to put something on your list to do as a health coach, reconnect your client with their body, (laughs) feeling what's going on inside. So, and we use the hunger fullness to do that. So we help client connect to hunger and fullness. And then we layer what diet culture is shamed, which is satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Feeling satisfied with eating is shameful in our culture. 
right? Either because of weight, either because of health status. I mean, who doesn't like pizza, right? So if you're part of the, I need to lose weight, oh my God, too many calories. And if you're part of wellness, oh my God, gluten and dairy, holy crap. I mean, being an unhealthy person, right? It's either one of the spheres has an opinion about pizza, but who doesn't like it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we shame ourselves for being satisfied and having pleasure with food. That's, we need to shift people back in connecting with what makes you satisfied and then cultivating pleasure around food, removing the shame. This is all mindset work. And then we move into a process, kind of the second block of the process of intuitive eating is what we call habituation, where we reintegrate the foods that were formally forbidden and we habituate our body, we build trust that these food will always be there. Best example I have for that is people coming off keto because we had a wave of keto and now people are coming off keto, right? So people have this massive shame around carbs and or they binge on carbs, right? So they feel that they need to restrict. We call that the pendulum swing, right? Restrict, binge. Mm -hmm. So habituation comes in and saying, we're going to introduce, let's say bread into your life. And we expect that you're going to eat it all the time, right? You have to build a rapport of trust between your soul, your spirit and your body to say, I will never again restrict bread. And I'm going to prove it to you because I'm always going to have it in the house Whenever you body want it, we're going to have it. And we know that the first four to six weeks, I'm going to eat all the sandwich in the world because I've been depriving sandwich for four or five years. Mm -hmm. So habituation comes in, in in that second phase to say, let's make the list of all the food that were restricted. And then we're going to rehabituate over a period of time to neutralize the food. Yeah. Right. When you come out of this, you can have like, I'm at the point where the I'm, I'm single. So my loaf of bread is in my freezer, because if I leave it in the fridge, it's going to dry up before me eating it. Yeah. But I used to have three loaves of bread a week because everything was sandwiched, right? right. Yeah, I, I it's like teaching, teaching folks that they can peacefully coexist with foods that were previously off limits. So the intuitive eating thing is so interesting. There's so many different rabbit holes we can go down, but we want to be really respectful of your time. Um, because I bet you a lot of coaches listening, because I'm gonna share an anecdote, think, sure. oh, well, I, I teach intuitive eating. Sure. So sure. I um I teach my clients hunger, fullness, and satisfaction and trust. Like this is just something that over time I've just evolved into, even before knowing. I truly didn't like Evelyn Terboli. She's amazing. Like to listen to her talk the way she describes it is, is really, really cool. But it, so Steph Godro, who you also know, cause that's where yes. I found you is through Steph Godro's yes. podcast. I had a long conversation in the Instagram DMS with Steph and she was so gracious. She actually like indulged me. This is ridiculous. I said, I'm in the intuitive eating space. Here's what I do with people. I teach them hunger, satiety, satisfaction, trust, and respecting their body cues and that they can heal their metabolism and lose weight if they do that. She's like, no. <laughs> she's like, if you that last bit, heal your metabolism. And lose weight. Yeah, she's like, you you if you call yourself, she's being very gracious. If you call yourself an intuitive eating coach, you're appropriating it to intuitive eating into a fat loss uh, space, which which is not in the spirit of in, in, intuitive eating officially. So yes. that's important as an important distinction to make. It's like, I can't call myself, I, I, you know, whatever, there's no regulations around this. So I can call myself whatever I want, but in the spirit of honesty, anytime we are speaking to fat loss or whatever, that. Well, right? it's like, more than just honesty. I'm called call the, the, the spade a spade is because as long as you continue to associate food to an outcome, you're yeah effing up the relationship to food to people right it's, it's that last piece that makes it not repairing the relationship mm -hmm. to food you're continuing to uphold that there's an outcome to food yeah. instead of completely separating the two yeah 
That's where I'm at. And that's, um, that's why I'm really grateful to, to speak with you. And I know this conversation is going to be, I'm, I'm sure Steph, that when you, when you train, well, the practitioners that come to work with you want to work with you, Yes. but I bet you there's a lot of people listening who are like, this, ain't, this ain't for me. I really want to help people get six packs. I'm not the, this isn't my jam, yes. but for those of us like me who are like, I think this is where I want to go. It's a lot of work. It, it is such a lot of work to unpack the heal your metabolism and lose weight. Like, you know what I mean? Like how, why did I have to, it's a lot, it's just a lot. And so I'm, I'm really thankful that you're so patient in teaching this to uh, people like me who are trying to learn it. And so and- here's my advice to all of those, because I deal with, all, they're sitting on my list typically a year before people like say, Oh, I'm going to work with you yeah. because what needs to happen at a practitioner level is the need to begin their own personal journey Mm -hmm. and realize their own stuff to like, Oh my God, you mean that's not normal. That's not not, like, I'm not supposed to behave like that. Oh my, Oh my God. Then they do their personal work just like I did. And I'm like, I can go out to the world and then promote what I just healed myself from. Mm -hmm. And that's when the business model or business change happen is after doing the personal work. So this unpacking in my world is done by doing your personal work. And then the rest comes like a hot knife and butter. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. So I have a question here too, because you know, what drove me to health coaching? Yes. It really wasn't a weight loss. Mm -hmm. I was just unwell. Yes. And changing the way I ate was a big Mm -hmm. part of what helped me feel well. So for me, food was a part of what led to my outcome. It wasn't the entire thing. Mm -hmm. It was also, you know, reducing stress and sleep and all these other things. But I think for so many people that come to health coaching, certain foods were triggers for them just genetically Mm -hmm. for some people, autoimmune, you know, what have you, but You know, so I I would love maybe some advice from you on how health coaches who came to health coaching Mm -hmm. through an epiphany with food and the impact Mm -hmm. that food had on their body. How do you, do you have to divorce that? Or is it really just from the weight loss conversation? Could you help me with that a little bit? So intuitive eating. So we've got the first component, hungerfulness, Mm -hmm. like neutralizing the food. And then the last piece is health. So the last piece is something called gentle nutrition. So nutrition still reside within the constraint of intuitive eating, but it shifts from the beginning to the end. So gentle nutrition does exist. So once we are able to feel our hunger, fullness, satisfaction, neutralize all the food, then we can start talking about how certain food makes you feel. And we want to also acknowledge that how we feel about eating a certain food is not just physical, it's mental. Yeah. IBS is starting, the research is starting to associate thoughts or how people think about a food and the sensation they're feeling in our body. We know through interoception awareness that it's happening, but it's very hard for science to like connect the dots. Mm-hmm. And it's starting to be acknowledged. The reason why IBS is unexplained is because we don't have the component to be able to prove that it's your thoughts that creates the discomfort. So when we talk about bread, example, gluten or like high carbohydrate diets, is really the unwell that you feel is because of the carbs or is it because of the shitty thoughts of guilt and shame you have when you eat the carbs? We don't know until we eliminate the shitty thoughts, which intuitive eating does, and then it lands you into a place of neutrality and then eat the carbs and tell me how you truly feel if you're not having the guilt and the shame with eating the carbs. We don't know that till we've done the recovery process. And then we can talk neutrally about gentle nutrition. So for an example, for me, corn, nuts, all these food do not go well in my digestive system. I'll spare you all the details, but it doesn't (laughs) go well, but I still have cashews in my pantry. And this morning I put cashews in small quantity in my breakfast. 
because I know I can handle some, but not eating an entire bag of cashew. Right. But in the past, shame on cashew, never had any cashew. I looked at people eating cashew, didn't have cashew. As soon as I had cashew, I ate the whole bag. <laughs> Where now I can have it in my pantry, have a handful of it on my breakfast and be done with it and not have the symptoms. That's mm -hmm. gentle nutrition. Does that uh, answer your question, Laura? Yeah, you know, I can relate to that. I mean, I, um, I, I tend to react to dairy as one example, but now that I, I guess have a better relationship with food and I, my body is healthier now, I can have some yogurt for breakfast. I just probably shouldn't be eating cheese all the time like that. You know what I mean? Like you just learn what serves you and what doesn't. And that's okay. Be okay with it. This is just my body. And this is how my body reacts to these things. And it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a thing thing, Yes. you know, and uh, move on, you know, instead of the black and white, never have dairy for my whole life ever again. And then binging on it when you do come across it. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh boy. Um, you've taught us a lot and there's so much more that I know we can learn from you, but we've kept you long enough. Yeah. Um, but the good news is that you do train practitioners. Yes. And so and do you still work with, with, uh, you work with clients as well, still as well? Yes. So okay. we have two, my business has two arms, not professional training and clients work. Okay, great. So um, for folks who want to learn more, I know you have a podcast to give us all of the all the thing. Yeah. So if you're listening to me on the podcast, we'll start with the podcast world. It's the easiest transition. So you go on your app and you look for going beyond the food, which is my client podcast. It's been running for six years. So there's a massive amount of episode there, but they're client focus. So maybe if you're on the personal journey, you start there. And then we started a podcast four months ago, strictly for professional called Undiet Your Coaching Practice. Cool. So you can go there and we talk like how to adapt to the non-diet business, business mindset, and then the particular of health at every size, intuitive eating and so forth. So transition to those two places. And if you're a professional, I would invite you to take my classes. I have two classes like webinar style. The first one would be the five step uh, to teach nutrition in a non-diet way and not put you through all the assessments. And then there's another one, if you're ready to transition your business, how to build a non-diet business. That would wow. be where I would start. Great. That's a lot. I, I really appreciate it, Stephanie. I um, you know we picked your brain a lot and I, I geeked out on, on learning from you. Uh, so thank you for, for being um, an educator in this space. I think it's really important. Yeah. And, yeah. And but what you're inviting me to do here for me is really important because this message is got to disseminate through our industry because it's still going to take two to three years for people to do their own work to get there. So as much as I can get out into the health coaching, health and businesses and share this message, I am here for that. It's about changing the culture in our industry. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was such a huge education and it was lovely to meet you. You're clearly very passionate about this and really invested in all of it. And I, you know, I can't wait to follow and see where all this goes. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.